They, really what I want to talk about is, is sequential programming really dead? And in fact, what I hope to convince you by the end of the day is no, that's what you should be doing. You should be doing sequential programming and forget about all the parallel nonsense that you hear. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so what I want to do is uh, we'll uh, start off by you know, learning from history. It's always good to remember history. You know? There's a lot of good lessons over there. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about the multi-core generation and its implications. Uh, and then we'll go to sort of the main point is we want to have parallel execution, but we want to have sequential programming. And we'll show you how to do that. Uh, and then, uh, you know, sort of postulate a future computing scenario and understand that, hey, you know, you can have parallelism can be a bad thing for you and, uh, and, uh, and what we'll do about it. And then add some concluding thoughts. So uh, for uh, Uri, people like Uri remember it, and Yale and Wenmei uh, uh, remember it, and Mark Horowitz remembers it, but most of the people don't remember the sort of the late 80s as people were trying to, late 80s, early 90s, people were trying to figure out how to go beyond very simple pipeline processors, okay? And they sort of referred to it as the quote, court, unquote, the post-risk uh, era. Uh, and there were, you know, there was the VLIW and EPIC approach, which was really what was being pushed as the future. Uh, you know, uh, Intel and HP were putting together this big thing, and that was going to be Intel's future, okay? Uh, IA64 and uh, uh, the old x86 IA32 was going to go away. There was a different school of thought, out of order superscalar thought. Uh, to me, it appeared it was the minority school. But uh, others tell me, no, the VLW was really the minority school, even though it was the more vocal school. But what the VLW and EPIC school was, they were descendants of high performance computing. Okay? Uh, you know, that's where you did parallel work. So, you know, that's so you took the high HPC experience and figured out how to take the HPC experience down into uh, the trenches. And the main thing to take away was, hey, you know, you have some program and you have parallelism in the program and you're going to have to figure out how to take the parallelism in the program and mold it into how it should be actually executed. Uh, and, you know, in the process of trying to create an effectively a static parallel representation, there were several problems that came up and there was a lot of research trying to solve those problems. Okay, I'm listening several of them. A lot of very good stuff, very interesting innovations came out over there. Uh, interesting research, I should say, if I use Kai's uh, model of innovation. Uh, uh, okay. The out of order superscalar people were not from the HPC school. Uh, and, you know, they, in the out of order superscalar mode, you never tried to statically search for anything. It just dynamically, uh, you know, you got the parallelism and the independence, but you didn't try and statically represent any independence. So what you did over there was create a dynamic parallel execution. Uh, of course, you have to have parallelism in the application. If you don't have parallelism in the application, you're not going to get parallelism. Uh, but there were none of the problems that were involved in statically creating a parallel representation. Okay. Now, you know, if you compared superscalar with VLIW, well, yes, superscalar wasn't as efficient as VLIW. There was more hardware involved. Okay. And you know, it was hard to get a resource saturated uh, uh, for cases that a VLIW easily could. But it was a very natural interface, uh, provided a very natural interface for a programmer ge generator. And more important, or equally importantly, not more importantly, you know, if there were some runtime uncertainties, uh, it was much easier to adapt to. You know, the same binary ran whether you had a, you know, single a uh, wide out of order superscalar processor or a four wide out of superscalar processor, which is unlike VLW, where the static binary was actually had to change. Uh, so there are a lot of takeaways from that history, uh, and I list some of the main ones. Uh, you know, one is, you know, the wisdom from HPC is natural to apply when you're trying to look for a parallel solution. Uh, but is this a good idea? That's the question one has to ask. Okay? Uh, importantly, I can get a parallel execution even without a parallel representation. Okay? Uh, the data flow style of execution that superscalar processors employed 
is much more flexible and much more adaptable than the control flow style of parallel execution. You could change the underlying hardware resources, things would work, you could add new forms of speculation, and so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, but it has overheads, and what we learned is that, hey, you know, we are willing to live with the overheads, perhaps, to get the benefits. And in this case, the overheads are hardware overheads. Okay? So now we are in the multi-core era. You know, parallelism is pervasive and universal. Uh, what are we going to do? So here's what everybody's saying, okay? What they're saying is, look, you know, let's take our HPC experience and bring it down. So we're going to create a program with parallelism expressed statically. And then we're going to teach students about parallel programming. And eventually, you know, when these students go move up and all the programs will be written by these students, they'll all be parallel programs. Okay? Uh, and so, you know, you're actually seeing people going around offering tutorials on how universities should be teaching parallel pro programming classes and so on and so on. Okay. Uh, then they are, you know, it's uh, uh, saying, well, okay, you know, we'll have some experts write some libraries in parallel, and ordinary programmers will use those libraries. So those of you who were around 20 years ago, and it's like squishing a watermelon seed, you know, uh, the same kind of arguments were used in the VLIW era. Is when you push them on one argument, that slip away and go to the, some other one. Okay, and you push that one, they'll go to some other one. Okay, uh, so, you know, so we are seeing the same thing again. It's over and over, okay? Uh, we actually have lots of experience with parallelism, okay? What people confuse, what we really want is we want parallel execution, and people confuse parallel execution with parallel programming, okay? Uh, and that's one of the things I want to sort of address. You know, we will get parallel execution, but we'll try not to have a parallel program. Okay, so we want parallel execution, regardless of what the static program is, whether it's parallel and gets parallel execution, that's fine, but we want to get it in the styles of program, program, you know, uh, programming language styles, uh, programming styles that we've been used to. We've been teaching people for 20, 30 years. So how do we uh, do that? So before, I think, you know, let's, you know, go back, you know, uh, there are very interesting papers from, you know, 50 years ago on talk about parallelism, theoretical papers on parallelism, and, you know, it's a fundamental observation is parallelism is on, uh, due to operations on disjoint sets of data. Uh, the static representation, which most practical programming languages deploy, is a much more control-driven representation where you know, you do this operation, this operation, and so on, in, in the order that they are there in the program. And when you need to do that, then you need, you know, when you have a control-driven language, you have to have synchronization, and so on, and so on, and you have all these kind of issues, and what really, what really you end up doing is you're gonna say, well, you know, I'm taking the parallelism that's there in my algorithm, and figuring out how that parallelism in the algorithm should execute on the underlying hardware, okay? And by the way, one assumption in this process that nobody say, talks about is I actually know what the hardware that I'm going to execute this program is going to be. Okay, I have knowledge about it. And we'll see that's going to be a very bad assumption going forward. So uh, data-driven, uh, uh, you know, uh, data-driven uh, uh, focuses on data dependencies. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to get a data-driven execution of a program on underlying hardware uh, because, it's, in my view, it's much more powerful. All sorts of nice things you can do if you have much more of a data-driven execution. And the analogy is, of course, you know, VLIW was a control-driven and parallel, and out-of-order superscalar was trying to get a data-driven execution from a sequential program. So, you know, People doing data flow work have been doing data driven execution for a, quite a while. And what they say is, hey, you know, write your programs in a functional language. Okay? So we'd like to achieve a data driven parallel execution. So do we need a data driven parallel language, uh, uh, you know, a uh, new programming language? No. Okay? Do we need to learn how to program in parallel? We need to learn how to think in parallel, but we don't need to learn how to program in parallel. Don't ever 
bother about a lock or a thread or anything like that. Okay? Uh, all right, how should we do this? All right. Uh, do we need to throw away everything and start from scratch? You know, I believe not. Okay? Uh, and this one's very interesting is, like I said, you know, you aren't going to know what the underlying hardware you're going to be executing a program is going to be in the future, in my view. Okay, so it's going to be very uncertain what the underlying hardware is. It's actually going to keep changing very frequently, too. Okay, so how are we going to deal with that? So, before we try and, uh, you know, uh, uh, think about that, you know, let's sort of postulate a model for what we might view the underlying hardware to be, okay? Uh, I think, uh, you know, everybody can agree on that they're going to have general purpose processing cores. And uh, I know Uri has been talking about asymmetric uh, processing cores for quite a while, and when May yesterday argued for having more symmetry rather than asymmetry, uh, and in my view, what's going to happen is it's like they're going to be area-wise, physically, they're going to be more symmetric, but capability-wise, they'll end up being more asymmetric. Okay, why? Because they'll have different predictor structures and the like. You know, you know one core will execute a certain piece of code more efficiently than another core just because it has predictor structures for that particular computation, for example. And what you're also going to have is you're going to have what I call an over-provision system where you will have more cores than you can power on at any given time by design, okay? And the set of cores that are powered on at any given time is going to keep on changing. And it's going to keep on changing very frequently at a much shorter interval than like an operating system quantum, for example, okay? So meanwhile, you know, uh, uh, I was giving this talk somewhere, and they were saying, gee, you know, like, you know, we produce 1,000, 1,500 PhDs every year, and we can teach all of them good parallel programming skills, and, you know, why would you want to have more people write code? Uh, well, unfortunately, a lot of people write code, whether you like it or not, okay? Uh, and when people write that code, you know, programmer productivity is more important, that notion of efficiency rather than the hardware notion of efficiency. Importantly, these three the, you know, these principles, these software engineering principles that the computer science community has been teaching its students for a few decades are now becoming, they are becoming the norm. Okay, modularity, abstraction, encapsulation, information hiding, object-oriented principles, and the like, okay? So many thousands of programmers, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of programmers are writing code uh, with those principles, okay? So, going forward, programmers are going to express computations in ways that they are very familiar with. Uh, sequential, modular, object-oriented, with very heavy uses of abstraction and encapsulation and the like, okay? The one change we want them to make is we want them to use a parallel algorithm Okay, and not work hard to artificially constrain the parallelism in the algorithm, in their code, but we do not want them to statically represent any parallelism. Okay, that's going to be their normal sequential code, for example. So what do I mean by that? Okay, if I'm writing a piece of code to add a vector of elements, okay, I don't want to you know, I, want to have, I wanted to use a parallel reduction rather than the sequential addition over there and code that algorithm like that, okay, a program like that, okay? So, so what the computer science community has drilled into their students for years is abstraction is a friend of software, okay? Uh, so now we're gonna use abstractions to help us use future hardware. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna view a program as a sequential representation of abstractions of computations, which we will then execute on a dynamically heterogeneous pool of hardware resources that's going to keep on constantly changing uh, in a data flow manner. Okay? So I'm going to have two versions, you know, two things uh, what we'll do about it. I'll start off with sort of the basic idea and then we'll go to a more advanced version of it. Is what we will do is we will try and get a data-driven parallel execution 
from a sequential program. Uh, it's going to be determinate and have race-free execution. Okay, I don't want to get into the formal notion of determinate, uh, but uh, a lot of people have different notions of, you must have heard the version, uh, words deterministic, everybody has a different de definition of deterministic and determinate and non-determinism and all that, but you know, for our purposes, what it means is that the sequence of updates to any variable are going to be the same as in the sequential program in any parallel execution of the program, okay? The program's gonna have no locks. The user level program's gonna have no locks. The programmer never ever knows about a memory model since everything is sequential. Uh, no explicit synchronization. It's going to be easy to, easy, much easier to write, uh, debug and maintain them than the parallel version. And we will see is we are gonna get comparable or you know, uh, a better performance than conventional the same program written in a more conventional parallel style, like using pthreads. So what we'll do is, again, you know, so we write the program as abstractions of computation. The first version, we'll write a method that operates on an object, okay, that, you know, updates an object. It could be reading other objects, but, you know, it, update, uh, it updates a single object. Later, we'll change this uh, restriction a little bit, even though it's worked quite well for us to be able to write several codes, okay? Then what we will say is, hey, you know, here is a method, a piece of code, that I know it's going to update this object, and I am, you know, in this region of the program, I think I may have some parallelism, so I'm going to possibly consider executing this method in parallel, okay? So I make a little annotation like that. Now, when my sequential program gets to such a method, okay, it'll determine the object that it's touching, and based on the dynamic object that it's touching, put it in a bin, okay? So everything that's updating the same object is gonna to go to the same bin, and everything that's in a different bin is gonna be on different objects, and parallel execution can happen, okay? So again, I have you know, some underlying parallel execution infrastructure, there's a sequential uh, thread that's walking through the sequential program, and when it sees a method, it's going to determine which up bin it's going to go into, and the parallel infrastructure then is going to start taking work from these different bins and execute them in parallel, and what's going to be in the different bins is going to be uh, 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 independent, okay? So, I, so I'm only going to care about dependence, okay? Uh, in an earlier slide that I took out, you know, to get a parallel execution, you first have to find the data dependency, the data that some piece of code is touching, then find the, its relationship to the data that other pieces of code are touching, and then go ahead and try and create a statically parallel program where different pieces of code could execute in parallel. What we are saying is simply try and help me figure out what data a piece of code is touching, and then then, you know, we'll take it from there, okay? Uh, importantly, you know, we get updates to a given state in the same order as a sequential program, so if your sequential program is correct, then your parallel execution is gonna be correct for that same input, okay? So underlying, we have some parallel execution structure that is very, it looks like a task execution system, okay? which are widely deployed these days, uh, task execution systems. Uh, I won't go into this, okay? So here's now, what we did is we took several uh, application programs that others had written in parallel using pthreads or, uh, you know, uh, OpenMP or MPI or whatever it is, and then we created our sequential versions of them in C++, okay? And, uh, then we ran them on several machines. Here are results for two different machines. Uh, one is a four-core AMD uh, Barcelona chip, and uh, this is an Ahalem chip with four cores and two threads per core. And, uh, you know, I don't have to, you know, go into the details of the bar. The takeaway is that the sequential versions, which are the Prometheus, which is our, what our library is called, are roughly similar in uh, 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 speed-ups achievable uh, than the parallel uh, uh, codes. And again, it's sequential, determinate, race-free, and so on and so on. 
And here are now on multi-socket machines, so we run the same codes. Uh, this is a four uh, core four socket. This is a four core eight socket. This is a, a Halem with four cores, two threads per core, and two sockets. Okay, again, without going to the details, the takeaway is sort of still the same. Okay. Uh, here's a different way of presenting the results. Here is how I so have different numbers of worker threads in my parallel in a, uh, execution infrastructure, which of course the programmer never ever sees. Uh, how the speed up changes uh, as the number of uh, threads uh, is varied. Okay, and you know it has all the nice properties that it increases, except when it doesn't. Okay, and I'll actually spend a fair amount of time on precisely this issue over here. Okay, this is pointing out a very, very important problem. This is not an artifact of our system. This is an artifact of parallel execution, period. Okay, and I will show you how we can do a much better job of handling this where we'll go like this rather than the other, uh, other situ uh, systems, okay? But this is a very important point that, you know, it, I think uh, needs uh, uh, to be brought out. Okay, so, uh, so our more recent version, we actually allow pieces of codes to have arbitrary, you know, read arbitrary objects and write arbitrary objects, and we do a complete data flow style execution on entire methods at a time, okay? Uh, what I want to do is I want to show you a simple example of a sequential piece of code and its parallel version in our uh, uh, way of looking at it, okay? So what I'm doing is I'm taking a, a bzip code where what you're doing is, you know, you're reading blocks from an input file and then you're compressing each block and writing the compressed block to an output file, okay? Fairly straightforward piece of code. So here is where the work is being done, most of the work, okay, in compressing the block, okay? So to uh, compress the block, you have a block object, and then you write this block object, the compressed version of this block object, to the output file, okay? So you have the output file pointer. This is a sequential version of the code. Here is the parallel version. Here is our version of the code that we run in parallel, okay? What we simply say is data flow execute, something, uh, and what is this something? You are, the something is this compressed function, and what you're, do, what you're uh, giving a parameter to this compressed function is a, this block over here. Then we go and say data flow execute the file write, okay, uh, file write this block and here's the file pointer, okay? So what will happen now is when our, our program thread is going through this piece of code, when it sees the data flow execute, it'll invoke the runtime system, what this runtime system will do is it'll evaluate all these parameters over here, get the tokens to those objects, the read and write tokens to those objects, and then call the method once it has all the requisite tokens to get those objects, okay? So here it'll get a write token to this block, here it'll want a read token to the block and a write token to the file pointer, okay? Then you'll go back again and start going for the next block, you'll get a write token to the next block, read token to the next block, and a write token to the file pointer over here, okay? What will happen is now this uh, method uh, can start executing. This will have, then wait for this one to execute because it needs this block. The, for the next block, the next file write will wait for this file write to happen because it needs to wait for this token to happen over here. But, you know, if you take a look at the parallel version of bzip, you have to do first do this, and then do this, and then do this, and then do this, and so on. Very different. Okay? And here again now are uh, the, you know, uh, again, benchmark for, uh, uh, benchmark, several different benchmark programs uh, for two different machines, uh, uh, eight uh, core machine and a 32 core machine. Again, the takeaway point is, you know, we are roughly getting roughly the similar performance over here. You know, it's not one is better than the other. But we are doing it with a sequential program that just looks very, very similar to, you know, very, very similar to what you've always been writing. No lock, no thread, nothing of that sort. Okay? Now, having done that, let me go to something else. Is it because Justin took some of my time? Or? <laughs> No, okay. That's okay if Justin took a little. He's entitled to it. Okay, so now 
you know, we're going to have multiple, uh, you know, multi-core processes everywhere, but we really aren't going to know the capabilities of the hardware or the operating environment when writing the code. Okay? So I'm going to be running, uh, writing my code. I don't know whether it's going to run on a two-core processor or it's going to be on an eight-core processor and on two of those cores of the eight-core processor some other programs run in. Okay? Or it's going to be eight-core processor and, you know, two have been turned off because got too hot and one is put in slower mode because it's going to get hot or whatever. Okay? Uh, and as the question then comes is, you know, how much parallelism should we have? So here's a very simple piece of code. It's a memory block copy. I'm copying a chunk of memory from one, uh, you know, block of memory from one, one region of memory to another region of memory. Very easy to parallelize. So the typical way of parallelizing it is, hey, I have n threads. I divide this block into n different sub-blocks and a thread copies over each block. Very simple. Okay? So we did that, and we run this code on three different machines. Let's not you know, worry about what these machines are. And here's what happens. You know, parallelism increases for as we increase the number of threads, and then it decreases. Okay? And this is using, you know, uh, uh, p-threads. Okay? Why does it decrease? Well, because there's resource contention. Okay. There's resource contention in this case for the, the memory bandwidth. Then the Halo machines are a little better than the Barcelona machines, especially the multi-socket Barcelona machines. Okay? Uh, and the uh, point of degradation is different on the different machines. Okay? So you say, okay, no, I only want to run it on one machine. Okay, same machine, but different data sizes. Okay? I have parallelism peak at different numbers of threads for different data sizes. Okay? That's not going to work either. So, importantly, I'm not going to have any clue of what the potential sources of performance degradation are going to be. Okay, I could have contention for memory resources, software locks in the user program. You could say, okay, I can get rid of those. Locks in kernel data structure, uh, you know, so on and so on and so on. The reason for that performance degradation earlier was because there was contention for a kernel data structure lock, okay? That actually a newer version of the operating system that we installed three weeks ago, that kernel data structure lock was replaced by a more scalable lock, so that contention went away, okay? So what we'd want is, we want to get a performance improvement, but then saturate, stabilize over there, okay? Not go down, okay? So how do we do it? Again, you don't create a parallel program. You create a sequential program. And then you dynamically expose the parallelism from that sequential program based on the operating conditions of the execution environment. Okay, so we establish a single point of control, detect when parallelism may be excessive, and there are a variety of different ways when we can do that. And then you control the exposure of the parallelism based on how much uh, parallelism that you have. So, you know, we did that, and again, what happens is we completely, you know, smoothen things out. We never get that performance degradation, okay? So, I want, you know, uh, the more results like that, and so, uh, I gave this talk, uh, and one May was there a few months ago at Illinois, and they said, oh, maybe it's an artifact of, uh, you know, you're using a dynamic work stealing system and not because of your sequential introduction of the parallelism. So what we did is we actually uh, took an open source version of a TVB and put this on top over there. And here are some results that we get over there where, you know, a couple of programs that somebody else had written, we didn't write them, okay? And what we took there, uh, their, you know, uh, task-based code and sequentialize all the tasks and then introduce those tasks one by one at a time. And while they weren't getting a degradation over here, we actually get a higher performance by reducing the contention. Okay, here they got a little degradation and, you know, we continued to go ahead. Uh, so Uri's not giving me the signal yet, so I better no, I try. You give me the one minute signal too? Yeah. Okay, one minute, Uri. Okay, <laughs> so the other issue is to ponder is, uh, uh, well, there are too many issues to ponder, but I think this one is the important one. You know, future-proofing software. The software you write now, you expect to be running for many years from now. You don't know what the hardware is gonna be, okay? So you don't even wanna bother the hardware, okay? 
then this is really the issue. And you know, what people may be thinking, hey, you, in some sense, you're writing a parallel program as far as sequential program. And my counter to that would be, you know, if you were able to write a parallel program, or if you were able to write a program with pieces of parallel work, put them in sequence, make them sequential. Don't think about a lock or anything like that, or a thread. Okay, just do it sequentially, everything will be just fine. Okay? So, to summarize, uh, I don't think we need to think about new ways of programming. Okay? I think we need to think about new ways about how to execute programs. Uh, we want programmers to think in parallel, but program sequentially. And, uh, you know, uh, to me at least, it's fairly clear that the future is going to be sequential programs that are dynamic parallel. Uh, data for parallel execution. If you want to write parallel programs, that's fine. There'll always be things for you to do, perhaps. But most people will be doing sequential. Thank you.